He is one of our friends. And today, no more. God has enabled them to come. And they will not just pass by. But they are going to sow a seed. You, are, uh, you should be grateful that you are among those that you receive this seed as pure as it was given because we are going to use just scriptures hallelujah hallelujah hello hello my name is Tony I'm a member of Grace Fellowship Church in Davenport, Iowa in the United States I am here with my pastor, Mike Reed, and my sister Emily, and my brother Jonathan, and I speak to you today under the authority of my pastors who have sent me out to proclaim the gospel. I come to you with love in my heart for you as my neighbors and because I love you so much I'm going to tell you something that some of you may hate and again I say these things to you because I love you I come to you with an open hand not so that you could put corn coins in my hand. I do not want anything from you. All I want is God's very best for you. I do not come tonight to offer you silver or gold because God makes no such promise. I do not come to you tonight to offer you health because God makes no such promise. I do not offer you tonight wealth and prosperity because God makes you no such promise. I do not come as a prophet I would not dare to give myself that name. I do not come as an apostle because there are no apostles in the world today. I do not come to you with visions and dreams. I do not come to you with the opinions of men. The only thing that you should believe when it is spoken by a man is if it is true according to the word of God. Anyone who claims to be representing God and gives themselves the title prophet or gives themselves the title apostle and they speak to you in ways that are contrary that are contrary to what the word of God says they are to be marked and avoided you are to run from them because they are liars and they are haters of God and they are haters of your eternal soul now I come to you as nothing but a man. A man who has been saved by the grace of God alone. Through faith alone. In Jesus Christ alone. And I come to you this evening with good news. The good news that your sins can be forgiven. The good news that you can be reconciled to the God you've offended. Offended by your sin. And the good news that you can have the assurance of eternal life. Not because you are good. Because you are just like me. You are not good. No, I come to offer you the gift of eternal life that comes by the goodness of God who would allow his perfect and precious and priceless son 
to die for sinners like you and like me. And you must understand this. While all of us have been created in the image of God, not all of us are children of God. That you breathe God's air. That you eat the food that He provides. That you drink the water that He provides. Does not make you a child of God. And I'm here today because I love you so much that I want to warn you that, that most of you within the sound of my voice are not children of God but children of wrath. And that might include some of the people up here with me. God knows their hearts. My prayer for you this evening is that God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, would give you ears to hear, minds that are able to understand, and hearts that are willing to believe and obey. Not the words of a mere man. Not the words of a mere sinner saved by grace. But the word of God. The authoritative. God breathed. Infallible. Inerrant. Word of Almighty God. I'm going to be reading to you today. From 2 Timothy chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, God's Word tells us this. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, Brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth so in this list of sins I hope as you were listening that you didn't turn to your right or to your left. That you didn't stare at your neighbor. That you didn't look behind you and point to someone else. But that you looked into the mirror of your own heart. And if you did not do that, let me help you. Lovers of self, in these last days, people will be lovers of self. They will be selfish. They will care only for themselves. They will care only for their own needs. The only life they will want to preserve is their own. 
Is this you today? Lovers of money. In these last days, people are greedy. And you need to look no further than at the visible church in your country. And in my country too. To see the worst kinds of greed as men and women claiming to be apostles and prophets will encourage you to give you their money making false promises promising you health, wealth and prosperity when they are not those gifts that they can give and they do that because they're greedy because they hate God because they hate you and they love their wallets more than they love the Lord people in these last days will be proud and arrogant. They will actually presume to judge God. If you've ever been in a courtroom, who wears the black robe? Is it the man or woman accused of a crime? Or is it the judge? But yet in these last days, people will presume to wear the, the black robes of the judge. And they will insist on on putting God on trial because they are proud and arrogant and the result of pride is destruction they will be disobedient to parents do you not see that in your country today? Do you not see the young disobedient to their parents? We see it in our country. And that begins at home. As parents please to live to please their children. Instead of children living to honor their parents. They take the, they take the command of God and they turn it upside down. And so instead of children honoring their parents. Parents turn their children into idols and worship them. In these last days people will be ungrateful taking for granted the basic things that God gives to all mankind that you are breathing God's air today is a gift from God and you need to understand it is a gift you do not deserve it is a gift that I do not deserve because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God God would be holy and righteous and just to take, to take that breath away from us. Sir, I ask that you stop playing music. I do not want to work up your emotions. I want to see the Lord God bring you to the conviction of your sin. I am not here to perform for you. I am here to preach to you. I am not here to entertain you. This is not a show. This is as real as life gets. There is nothing more important than your soul. And I am here tonight as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. To plead for your souls. And in a spiritual way to fight for your souls. Because I love you as my neighbor. And I do not want to see anyone here. Anyone within the sound of my voice. I do not want to see you perish in your sin. Because hell is real. 
And death is sure. And you are all going to stand before God to give an account. And he is not going to accept your dancing. And your singing. And your giving. And your giving. Or your good works of any kind. Because the one who does wear the black robe. He cannot be bribed. In these last days people are unholy. Instead of being set apart by God as holy. They set themselves apart from God to be unholy. In these last days, people will be heartless. They will show no remorse. They will show no remorse for the lies that they tell. They will show no remorse for the things they have stolen. They will show no remorse for the murder in their heart. God calls that hatred. God sees, God sees hatred as murder of the heart. If you look down on anyone, if you are angry without cause, if you harbor bitterness or resentment in your heart toward any human being, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the tribe to which they belong, regardless of how much or how little money they have in their wallet, and you are without remorse, and you are unrepentant. God sees you as a murderer at heart. In these last days, people will be unappeasable. That means they are never satisfied. They always want more. They have to have more. They refuse to be content when they have a lot. They refuse to be content when they have little. And so false prophets and false apostles and false teachers like lions prowling about seeking someone to devour will, will see that discontentment in your heart and they will play to that discontentment in your heart and if you have only two coins to rub together these men and women who are haters of God and haters of you will say ah give me your money and then God will give you more and then you'll be content they are liars from the pit of hell people in these last days will be slanderous they, they will lie to you about who Jesus is. And you will lie to yourself about who Jesus is. As I've driven through the towns between here and Nairobi, many times I have seen billboards with pictures of a man I presume is to represent Jesus. And full of color. Color to the skies blasphemy. Jesus is portrayed as a blonde haired 
Blue-eyed. Man who looks more like a woman than a man. And they say that is Jesus. That is not who Jesus is. The Word of God says that when Jesus walked on this planet, 2,000 years ago, that if you did not know him or know of him, and you bumped into him on the street, you would have no idea that you rubbed shoulders with Jesus. But yet in these days, they want to make Jesus look like a queen instead of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But that's not the only way that people lie about Jesus. As mankind creates many different Jesuses in their imagination. The Jesus who promises you health, wealth, and prosperity. That Jesus doesn't exist. The Jesus who is all love. That Jesus does not exist. Now you might hear that and think, what is he saying? Is Jesus not loving? Jesus' love is perfect. And so is every other aspect of his character. Jesus is not all of any one thing. Jesus is perfectly loving. And Jesus is perfectly filled with wrath. Jesus is perfectly holy. Perfectly righteous. Perfectly just. He is all of these things at the same time. Always and perfectly. And so if you've created a Jesus, or if you've heard of a Jesus that is all love, then that Jesus cannot save you. Because he doesn't exist outside of your mind. In these last days, people will be without self-control. They will be lustful. They will be drunkards. They will be adulterers. They will be fornicators. And maybe I describe some of you. And I know that there are men that I have described. Certainly not all men. Not all men in this group. Because I know men in this group who are not this way. But when I think of the fornicators in your country and mine, when I think of adulterers in your country and mine, when I think of drunkards in your country and mine, all I have to do is look to a pulpit to find him. And that's what's happening in these last days. In these last days, people will be brutal. I come from a wicked country the United States of America and it's wicked for many reasons and one of the reasons is my country is brutal and your country is following my country my country murders 3,000 children every single day and they call it a woman's right to choose they call it abortion that's not even a strong enough word it's murder it is murder and your supreme court has just said Kenya will be brutal we will take pride as Kenyans in our brutality as we will wholesale murder our children just like the Americans in these last days people will not love what is good 
They will call what is evil good. They will call good what is evil. And I just spoke strongly about one of them. The, the murder of unborn children. In what is supposed to be the safest place on planet Earth. The womb of an expectant mother. And now we also call other things good that are evil. Such as men pretending to be women. And women pretending to be men. And being willing to mutilate our children. Because a boy wants to play with a doll. Or a girl wants to pick up a bat and a ball. And so all the little boy has to do is say, Mommy, Daddy, I think I'm a girl. And all a little girl has to do is say, Mommy and Daddy, I think I'm a boy. And then with murder in their heart, they will take the most precious gift, temporally speaking, that God has ever given them, and that is children, and take them to some man or woman called a doctor, where they will cut their children to pieces. The list goes on. I think you get the point. And again, as I was talking about these things, were you thinking, well, I've never done that? But do you turn a blind eye to those who do? Are you someone who would say, I would never abort my child? But hey, it's none of my business. A woman has a right to do what she wants with her own body. She's not killing her body. She's killing her baby's body. But are you being honest with yourself? As I have to be. Are you looking into the eyes of your neighbor to see that you're better than them? Or are you willing to look into the mirror and say, I am that man? Or I am that woman? All people sin, my friends. Every one of us sin. Every one of us has broken the law of God that he has written on our hearts. Whether with our actions, or with what goes on in our minds, or with what comes out of our mouth. We have broken God's law every day and we know it. And as such, we are without excuse. There is nothing you could say about your sin that will make God turn a blind eye to it. That will make God forget it. If you were standing before a judge in a courtroom, having been found guilty of breaking the law. And the judge asks, what do you have to say for yourself? And you say, your honor, I am guilty. And I am very sorry. And I'm going to try never to do it again. So I think you ought to let me go. Is a good judge going to let you go? Or is a good judge going to follow the law? The good judge is going to follow the law. He's not going to let you go because you're sorry. You ought to be sorry you violated the law. So let me put you in that courtroom for a moment. It is the day of sentencing. And you have tried to get the judge to let you go. But the judge is not corrupt. 
It's not going to take a bribe of your money or your good works or your sorrow over your crime. And the judge says to you, I sentence you to death. And there are no appeals. They're going to whisk you into the next room. They're going to drive a needle into your arm. And they're going to put you to sleep forever. But before that happens, the judge who found you guilty, the judge alone who had the authority to sentence you to death, stands up from behind that bench. He takes off those black robes of authority. And he steps down and he approaches you. And he looks at you and he says, Mercy. Jonathan. Cyrus. Tony. Tony. I found you guilty and you deserve to die. But I am going to take your place. And the judge who did no wrong, the judge who rightly sentenced you to die having found you guilty, goes into that next room and he allows a needle to be driven into his arm with your name on it dying the death that you deserve so that you could be set free you are not innocent you are not good you are guilty as sin itself why would the judge do that? Only because he loved the one he sentenced to die. What would you think of that judge? What would you think of that judge? I've, I've asked thousands of people that, come, that, that question. Some people laughed and said the judge is a fool. Some of you are that man or that woman. Others have said I'd be so grateful I would love the judge forever. And in the lives of some that is true. That graphic picture I just painted for you is a picture of what God actually did for sinners. God the Father sent his son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Truly God, truly man, and without sin. Now I must pause here for a moment. Because I want to make sure you understand which Jesus I'm talking about. I'm talking about the eternal Son of God. The, sec the second person of the one and only triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who was with the Father in creation all things, including you and me created by Him and through Him and for Him born of a young virgin woman that the prophet Isaiah predicted would give birth to the Christ child 700 years before he was born. He is the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah who will judge both the living and the dead. And he is the savior of his special people. God the Son humbled himself. 
He did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Meaning he didn't have to cling to that as if he was afraid he was going to lose it. Even though he stepped down to take on human flesh. While truly man. Was indeed truly God. This Jesus. Unlike you and me. As God in the flesh lived a life of perfection. He lived that perfect life for some 33 years that you, my friends, and I can't live for 33 seconds. He lived in perfect obedience to his Father in heaven. Yet even though he knew no sin, at a time appointed by God the Father, before the foundation of the world, God the Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, voluntarily submitted himself to the torturous bloody death of a Roman cross. He died a death he did not deserve to take upon himself the punishment all of you and I rightly deserve. He shed his innocent blood on the cross. The only sacrifice God would accept for sin. God will never accept your sacrifice of going to church on Sunday while living like hell Monday through Saturday. God will, God will never accept your praise with, his, with your lips while your hearts are far from him. God will never accept the imperfect sacrifice of your good works. Again, he will only see that as an attempt to bribe the judge. And yet the word of God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The question is, not whose blood God would accept. He will not accept yours. He will not accept mine. He will only accept the blood of his son. The question is whether or not that perfect blood, his perfect righteousness, will be credited to your account. Jesus died that death on the cross and then he was buried. And three days later, he forever defeated sin and death when he rose from the grave. Unlike Mohammed who is dead, unlike Buddha who is dead, unlike Krishna who is dead, unlike every self-appointed bishop who is dead, unlike every man elected pope who is dead, unlike every false god created in the imagines of men that is dead, Jesus Christ is alive. 40 days after he rose from the grave, he ascended back into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of power where he rules and he reigns and where he shares his glory with no one. And again, when he returns, he is not going to return as a baby meek and mild in a manger. 
He's going to return as a lion of the tribe of Judah to judge both the living and the dead. And the word of God says that the blood of his enemies will drench the hem of his robes. Will that be your blood? Will it be your blood that drenches his robes? Or will it be his blood that washes away your sin? What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make you whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And know this. Any man or woman who tells you they know when Jesus is coming back. Oh, and for a few shillings he'll tell you. Not only does he not know when Jesus is coming back. He doesn't know the Jesus who is coming back. And he is coming back. And he will take his people home. And what God requires of you, what God requires of everyone within the sound of my voice, what God requires of every human being, including me, is that by faith you turn from your sin. You turn from the list of wickedness that I read to you this evening. You turn from that sin not to earn or to keep God's love. You turn from that sin because of the love that God has shown you through the gift of His Son. And by faith and by faith alone, you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I had a conversation this morning with a dear friend of mine, a precious young man. And he told me that he believes in Jesus. And, and, he, and he told me true things about Jesus. Things that I could hear in any church in Kenya or America on a Sunday. Things I hear often on the streets. But I asked the young man some important questions about that belief in Jesus. And he struggled to answer. Because everyone I've spoken to in Kenya, they all say they're saved. They all will declare Jesus as Lord. But their lives do not reflect that. Most people will praise Jesus with their lips. But their hearts are far from him. Because while they may believe in their head, they do not believe in their heart. They have not put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So obviously I flew in an airplane to come here from Davenport, Iowa 8,000 miles is too far for this old man to walk so I sat for many hours in a plane at about 35,000 feet obviously the plane did not crash because here we are but what if, as we were flying on that plane, and we did experience some interesting turbulence that maybe gave us a moment of pause, what if the plane goes black, the emergency lights come on, and the pilot, with fear in his voice, says the plane is going down there's a parachute underneath your seat you're scared you believe what the pilot's telling you you look under the seat you see that a parachute is there the plane gets low enough to open the doors and the doors open 
And the pilot orders everybody to jump for their lives. And you believe in that parachute. Now And you leave it under the seat. Now And you run out the door. Screaming all the way down to your death. I believe in parachutes. I believe in parachutes. I believe in parachutes. And you keep saying it until your body hits the ground and you die. Did it do you any good to say you believed in the parachute while not bothering to put it on? Many of you within the sound of my voice will say with your lips, I believe in Jesus, but you've never truly turned from your sin and put your trust and your faith in Jesus alone for your salvation. You've never put on the Lord Jesus Christ the way a person jumping out of a plane puts on a parachute, which means you're still lost and you're going to die and you're going to stand before God screaming I believe in Jesus because the word of God says that there will come a time when every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and the vast majority of people will utter those words as they enter into hell to burn for all eternity because they believed in Jesus in their head but they did not give their life to Christ they did not turn from their sin and put their trust in Christ alone for their salvation here is something that the false prophets the false teachers and the false apostles will not say to you because you will not pay them to say it. In that same chapter that I read to you, the Word of God says, everyone who seeks to live a godly life a life pleasing to God will be persecuted. And that message doesn't sell. But it's the truth. Again, I didn't come here tonight to tell you to believe in Jesus and all your problems will go away. To believe in Jesus and the cancer will go away. To believe in Jesus and your husband or your wife will stop cheating on you. Believe in Jesus and your kids will stop doing drugs. I'm not trying to sell you anything tonight. No, what I have for you is much better. It's an eternal hope. It's a living hope. Protected by God in heaven. For those and only for those who by faith and by faith alone receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. If you come to genuine repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, not only may your life not get easier, but it may get harder. It could cost you your friendships. It could cost you your family. It could cost you your home. It could cost you your job. It could cost you your physical life. So what? For what does it profit a man? What does it profit a woman? If she gains the whole world. 
If he gains the whole world, but yet forfeits his soul, forfeits her soul, what, my friends, will you give in exchange for your soul? How much, how much is your soul worth? That next one night stand? That next fornication? That next crime you're thinking of committing? That next drug you want to put up your nose or in your vein? That next bottle of liquor you want to drink? Really, is, is that all your soul is worth? My family and I came here tonight because your souls are worth much more than that to us. Is there any sin in your life that you love so much today that you're willing to die and spend eternity in hell so that you can enjoy that sin today? Do not harden your hearts, my friends, like so many do in these days of rebellion. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives, he gives grace to the humble. And why is God opposed to the proud? Why are there no proud people in heaven? There are, no, there are no proud Pentecostals in heaven. There are no proud Baptists in heaven. There are no proud Lutherans or Methodists in heaven. There are no proud people in heaven. There are no proud parents in heaven. There are no proud athletes in heaven. There are no proud businessmen in heaven. There are no proud prophets or apostles or false teachers in heaven. There are no proud people in heaven. Why? Because God humbled himself. Because God the Son humbled himself to not only take on human flesh, but to die a death he did not deserve on a Roman cross so that he could save for himself his people. I began by telling you all that no one is a child of God simply because they were created in the image of God. And most people, within the sound of my voice, most people on this planet are not children of God, they are children of wrath. But if you will humble yourself, if you will repent of your sin, if you will receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and put your faith in Him, not faith in your faith, but faith in Him. God will cause you to be born again. He will take your heart of stone that makes you an enemy of God and he will give you a heart of flesh. You'll begin to love the things that God loves. Namely him. And not with your lips. Not merely with your lips. But with your heart. And you will begin to hate what God hates. Namely your own sin. And you will not try to bribe the judge. You will want to live a life pleasing to God. Not to earn his love or to keep his love. But because you're so thankful for the love he has shown you. Through the gift of his son Jesus Christ. Do not harden your hearts. There are no proud people in heaven. Humble yourself. Turn to Christ and live. 
Not for your best life now. Not for these things this fallen world has to offer. Things that are only going to burn and pass away. Turn to Christ and live. Be given a new life. An eternal life. Secured in heaven forever. And by faith. Not faith in your faith. But faith in Jesus Christ. You will be able to endure this life. You will be able to consider it all joy. When you encounter any kind of trial. Because you will know that the testing of your faith. Produces endurance. And Jesus said those who endure to the end. Will be saved. And that is not an endurance in yourself. That is an endurance given by God. There is hope in Christ. There is no hope in health and wealth and prosperity. There is no hope in the charlatans that have invaded your country, coming, most of them coming from mine. There is hope in Jesus Christ. Turn to Christ and live. While God has given you time. And thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions?